Welcome to our uh, Meet a Nose program. If you're not familiar with Meet a Nose, it's a conversation series. Uh, today we're speaking with Andreas Keller. Now, Andreas has a very short bio, which belies his amazingly accomplished and long career. So that's cool. We'll have more time to talk about it in person, but I'll just read his short bio now. Uh, Andreas Keller is the author of The Philosophy of Olfactory Perception and is a New York-based academic with PhDs in both neuroscience and philosophy. Andreas has a multidisciplinary interest in olfactory perception and is the owner and operator of Olfactory Art Keller, which is a new art gallery dedicated to olfactory art that is launching, I believe, in January. Is that right, Andreas? Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what's that like launching a gallery? We'll start with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> where do you start, right? Yeah. I mean, since I have no idea how you're supposed to be doing it and just make it up as I go along. It's a lot of fun. Um, but we'll see if it will also be successful once it comes to it. And of course, like everything else everybody's doing, there's the COVID uncertainty above everything that makes everything a little more difficult to, to plan in advance, right? How's the world gonna be in January? Probably pretty bad. How's the world gonna be in May, in June, who knows? Probably a lot better. <laughs> a lot better. That's yeah. that's my, my, my theory is that January is gonna be the worst and then it's gonna get all better after that. Interesting. So, 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 okay. So how, I'm sort of, we started with like, how's it to launch a gallery, but what we should have done is, is say, is start from the beginning. So let, let's do that. So I'm interested because you have two PhDs. You're one of two people I know with two PhDs and I find that really impressive. And your first PhD is in neuroscience. So, so tell me a little bit about what you were studying uh, when you were doing um, neuroscience. Right. So like in, in, it's like neuroscience slash genetics or neurogenetics or whatever people want to call it. And so the work I've been doing in my PhD, this is back in Germany and beautiful Würzburg, right? In the PhD. And so what I did is fruit flies. So fruit flies are genetic model organism because you can change their genes including their odor and receptors, and then study the consequences of that. And so what I started doing there <clears throat> for my PhD is was studying how fruit flies process visual information, right? So people know flies have this better temporal resolution. They see a movie like a slideshow and, you know, like other, they have those like little facets that they see and so on. So just like how does that work in the fly with genetic methods? And so that's what my, my PhD ended up being. And then after the PhD, I looked for a postdoc as one does when one wants to have an academic career. And I tried to do something similar, but a little different so that I can use the things that I learned, but also you know, can have a fresh start in a, in a new interesting field. So I decided to go um, and, and look at smell in fruit flies because the receptors that bind to the odorants were just newly discovered and were an interesting field of study. And that's where I came to New York, to Rockefeller University. Leslie Fosfall was the, my boss there. I worked in her lab and we studied the, um, studied the odor and receptors in fruit flies um, with genetic methods and, and, and behavioral methods. What were, you, what were you hoping to find? I mean, what was the purpose of just a general understanding of their odor and receptors? Yeah, I mean, it's the general idea was to like decode olfaction as the scientists like to call that. So the way very briefly smell works is that we have different receptors. Um, and by we, I mean humans and fruit flies, everything has different receptors and depending, and the odors bind to those receptors and different odors bind to different receptors. And so what you get from an odor is a code an olfactory code that an odor may activate 
five different receptors, and then the brain somehow knows, oh, I'm smelling vanilla. And so obviously in humans, this is very complex. We have 400 different receptors. That's the, you know, the, the biggest gene family in our genome. And in fruit flies, it's much less than that. So in fruit flies, you can more realistically hope that if you block one of those receptors, you will see a change in the behavior of the fly in response to an odor. And then you know from that behavior and the genetics how they compute this information, how they build up that code. That's what people, scientists like to call decoding olfaction. And you want to start in a simple model organism for the reduced complexity. Is this some, um, because I know Luca Turin was also doing some work more recently, I think, with fruit flies. Are you familiar with his, with his work in this field as well? Yeah, I'm familiar. So Luca Turin, you know, when I say um, that an odor binds to different receptors, then that's, I think, what he would disagree with. He would say the odors bind to all the receptors, but then the receptors read out the vibrations of the odor molecule. And so the odor activates only a, a subset of receptors. And he, you know, he kind of went the opposite way that I went, started studying this in humans and then became more mechanistic and started testing fruit flies too. Yeah, because I, I, I was at a lecture he gave in Canada, which I guess it's two years ago now, where he was talking about um, quantum olfaction using fruit flies to try to prove his, his purpose. So um, yeah, OK. So fruit flies, I didn't know they yeah. were so connected to to smell, you know. Um, well, that's how they find your garbage, right? They, they, ah, of course, it's clever you know, little guys. They, 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 they go there to lay their eggs, and then the larvae hatch there, and then they find another pile of garbage. So they are very, very olfactory driven. Yeah. So you they did your their post nose is in their antennae, so it's like all oh, like a, it's it's weird on the outside, but. The interesting thing is that the, com the, the computational logic seems to be very similar in all animals that have a sense of smell. Why is it that they pick out the garbage? You know, I mean, what is it? Is, is, so you said it's it's based on smell that they that they can find it, but what is it about the garbage? Does it have a lot of nutrients for their larva or something like? Yeah, it's a good substrate for the larva. So they need some, you know, like rotten fruit is the ideal, ideal living environment for the larvae. All right, hence fruit flies, duh. Hence fruit flies, duh. <laughs> yeah, so bananas smell like the usual, like isoamyl acetate is a banana smell that's very, very attractive for them. And vinegar, vinegar smell, acetic acid, very attractive. So. You can trap them, you can put a trap in your kitchen with a vinegar in it and they will find it and fly. Mm. So after after you came to New York to do your, your postdoc, um, at some point you sort of, you started moving towards smell in humans, you know, yeah. and, and being interested in sort of how humans are, are working with scent. So can you, can you explain sort of, or talk about that transition? Yeah, so mm -hmm. like, as I said, what I did in fruit flies is I was making mutants um, that are missing a one of those odor end receptors to see how does that affect the behavior of the flies towards those smells. And then while I was doing that, this was the time where sequencing human genomes become more routine and like we got many, many new New, many genomes of different individuals in. And one of the most surprising, fascinating, interesting things in those human genomes was how variable the odor and receptors are between two individuals. So you and me have very, very different odor and receptors. And just by looking at the um, sequence, the gen genomic sequence of those receptors, 
one could tell that many of them are non-functional. So they have like stretches in there that wouldn't translate into a useful receptor. And so seeing that, uh, the geneticists called them pseudo genes. So they are, they, they look like genes, but we can tell they're like ruins, the ruins of what used to be a gene. And, and you know, like you and I will have odorant receptors where I have a functional odorant receptor and you have the non-functional version and the other way around. So pretty much what I've been doing in fruit flies could also be done in humans, but not by making those mutants, but by finding them. So one would just have to go out and sequence odor and receptor in people to find out who has this functional version, who has the non-functional version, and then test sense of smell of those people. Um, and so this is in the analogy, the interesting analogy, I guess, is uh, color blindness, which is also a mutation in, in this case, the receptors for colored light in the eye. And so that was very intriguing because it's very rare um, that you get a chance to study gene function in humans because mostly it will be selected against and then it will be very rare to have a non-functional gene. So I was intrigued enough by that to go and try doing that. And the way one does that then is you put an ad on Craigslist, say like, hey, we look for people to smell stuff and give a blood sample that we can sequence. And then they came in and we made them smell many, many different smells and just asked about them, how strong is the smell? And then repeatedly and at different concentrations. And that's a good, not an ideal, but a good enough measure of how sensitive somebody is to smells. And so one finds people who are insensitive to smells, other people can smell just fine, something that people like to call specific anosmia, anosmia being no smell and specific meaning it's specific for certain odors. So one finds those people with specific anosmia and then one sequences the 400 odorant receptors. And then one does a lot of magic to try to find if there's a mutation that would explain the sensitivity to smells. And so specific anosmia is I guess like one that, that can be experienced with the asparagus urine smell. So some people, urine has a special smell after eating asparagus. And some people report that this is true and others say, no, that isn't true at all. And so for a while, scientists thought that some people make that smelly compound and others don't, but the reality is everybody makes it, but some people can't smell it. Wow, that's super so, interesting. So this is a, a relatable case. Yeah, it's like yeah. the, you know, like the scientific genius was to just make people smell each other's urine and then find <laughs> out that it's not, you know, that it's not there. It's just Fun. that you can't smell it. So that was the, the breakthrough experiment there. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there's other examples like the whole cilantro, how some people right. dislike cilantro because it smells like dish. Um, like like soap or something like yeah. that. Um, that is an odor and receptor. There was very recently, a few weeks ago from Iceland, like some people can't smell sticky fish smells or rotten fish. And so they can't on. smell them at all? Can't smell them at all. Wow, that's um, interesting. And so there's, there's many of those specific anosmias. There's many, many more than those. These are unusual examples because mainly what the smells are of things we encounter like banana smell that's dozens of different molecules so everybody can smell a banana nobody is like smell blind to bananas and can't mm. smell bananas because even if you can't smell a few of those molecules that make up the banana odor you still smell the banana right. so it's difficult to discover those molecular specific odor blindnesses in the real world where everything is a mixture. 
So really, when it came into the scientific, um, the, the, the idea came up among scientists that it exists is when chemists started to uh, synthesize and isolate, yeah, yeah. And then in their comments, they would write, and it smells like this and that. Mm. And then some other chemists would try to reproduce that and be like, oh, I must have done something wrong. Mine doesn't smell. And interesting. So wow. This like single molecule. It's interesting that it has to be discovered, but color blindness also had to be discovered, right? Right now we think like, oh, this is obvious. But there was actually like, you know, somebody who was reading a, a botany book and like reading about the color descriptions of different flowers and nothing made sense to him. And then he was like, what is this all about? These are all the same colors and you say they are different. And only that's how they discovered that some people are colorblind. So those wow. things aren't obvious. In when everything. was that? Do you know when that happened? That discovery, more or less? Yeah, like I mean, the guy was Dalton. Um, that's why color blindness is sometimes called Daltonism too. And right. it was 17 something. 17 something, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I always wonder how people discover these things. Like, I, I often wonder about how people discover the, discover the specific uses of drugs also. And you always think there was some poor individual who inadvertently took it, you know, and was like, ah, and then we know, you know. Um, well, but, all the things we can eat and not eat, right? Like, who yeah. went out there and tried And, and tried that out. I mean, you know, somebody together. suffered for that knowledge, you know. Somebody it's, suffered. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, so, so what, what it sounds to me like at this point, you're in your scientific work, you're getting towards perception, and, and at some point, you make the leap towards the philosophy of perception um, with yeah. a specific and olfaction. So, what what brought you to philosophy from science? Yeah. So, like, I always had an interest in philosophy, but then I got this very nice grant that was out of Switzerland. They are an organization that's called society in science and they believe scientists are too much focused on their bench work and on publishing and don't you know like look at the interdisciplinary bigger societal context of things enough and so i applied for that and said like you know like perception is a scientific and philosophical problem right because the whole how we consciously perceive something that is very, very difficult for science to investigate because you don't have a objective measure of subjective experience. It just doesn't work like that, right? So that famous college philosophy question, does your blue look like my red? It's very hard to see how a scientist would be able to answer those basic questions. Um, requires some philosophy. So I suggested that and they gave me a grant for five years and the grant um, is meant to be used so that you spend half of your time continuing your scientific research and the other half of your time doing something that's related to the same topic but isn't scientific research. And so I was like, I'm gonna, you know, like do philosophy. I'm gonna uh, go to grad school and take classes and read philosophy. And so that's how I ended up then getting that second PhD in philosophy. Second PhD is much easier than the first PhD because you kind of know how it works and can do it with a, with a lower effort. Um, but that, that was a, a wonderful grant and I had a, a great time in those five years, but it kind of also ruined me for an academic career because it's difficult to go back to you know a grant driven career planning work after you had five years of complete freedom and oh my god i can i can only imagine <laughs> so i i didn't like my my reintegrating into the real world of academia didn't work out well and so I, I, I dropped out of that. Um, and look at you now <laughs> opening a gallery you crazy guy. <laughs> look what happened. <laughs> what <are you> thinking? <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. I mean, I, I had an arts uh, uh, education, so for me, it's a given that that, that grant-driven, competitive, sort of academic, scientific world would be challenging, but I can't imagine once you've tasted freedom. 
Yeah. I need to go back to that. Yeah. Um, so, so I posted in the in the chat the link to Andreas's book, um, which I, I, you know, I highly highly recommend if you're interested in philosophy and perception, uh, with an emphasis obviously on olfaction because that's what it's about. But um, was that part of the grant that that book came out of that grant, Andreas? Was that? Yeah. So this is a, a you know a, a rewritten version of my my dissertation. So the whole idea what I did during my my, my focus on philosophy was I would take, so there's something called philosophy of perception, which is about the, you know, is how do we know your red isn't my, my blue and are colors just in the head or are they out in the real world? And those kind of philosophical questions about perception, but they're traditionally all answered using vision as the paradigm sense. So it's like, you know, the examples and the explanations are all about visual perception. And then they draw their conclusions about perception as a whole from that. And so my whole project is really just like taking some piece of philosophical work about perception that's based on vision and say like, okay, what would happen if we would base this on olfaction instead? What would happen if olfaction would be our paradigm sense? Would we come to the same conclusions or to different conclusions? And so it is, you know, that the dissertation isn't like one long argument um, that, that then defends a, a conclusion. It's more like individual chapters where individual topics are taken and like, okay, let's think about this if we look at all faction instead of vision, what does come out of it? And um, in, in enough cases, there's a different different conclusion that you would come to if you use all faction than, than vision. And in some cases, which is also interesting, you come to the same conclusions. And so that's what I did both for my dissertation and then in a expanded and modified version for the book. And so since since the book came out, have you been working primarily in that field of, of philosophy of perception or, or what have you been, have you been pursuing that? Yeah, what I've been doing, well, I, it's been a, you know, like since I, I, I quit my academic job, uh, it's been a mix of doing some teaching um, and doing some consulting work. And I also have a, a project going on still with Rockefeller University where I was a postdoc for decades. Um, and that project is a clinical test of olfactory function. So in our work there, we developed a way of testing a patient's sense of smell. So you may have noticed that, that if you go to the doctor and say, I can't smell, they're like, well, that's too bad for you. There's no, you know, like it's very rare that you find a doctor that will actually test you. Yeah, or yeah. Even other than in the context of COVID, of course, but yeah. Uh, yeah, COVID yeah. Gave, gave a big push on that, but you're also, <laughs> you're also hard. It's, it's difficult to find any any doctor, like their, their training just doesn't involve smell totally. testing. And then, then think how frequently you get, or well, like not how frequently, but how normal it is to get your hearing tested or a vision test, right? That's totally, yeah. Very common thing. And so that there's reasons for that. And one big reason is that smell is so uh, unreliable. I'm just going to say it's unreliable. So you re need to repeat the same question over and over again and come up with an average um, because of the variability in the perception. And so we developed a test um, that would solve many of those problems and would be a more reliable and nicer test. And so I've been working on just turning that into a um, into a, a product that then will like actually profit um, patients that have problems with their sense of smell. So that's the kind of like, is... it's like almost the opposite of, of doing art, right? It's like FDA approval, right? strategies and, you know, product design. But product this is for the medical community, right? I mean, it's for the doctors to use. Yeah. Exactly. The, 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 the plan 
for this is to be in doctor's offices, ear, nose, throat doctors. So they have routinely a way of testing a person's sense of smell when that person complains about it or when there's like surgery in the nose that has to be done or things like that. And so I've been working a lot on that. Um, I've been working some on philosophy. I was just at a Zoom meeting last week in Germany on on um, on, on, on olfactory philosophy, and I'm editing a book about it with a colleague in Nevada. But you know, those are things I don't get paid for, so they right. don't take up mm. they don't take up that much of my time. They're more of a hobby at this point. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I remember you telling me about this group of uh, olfactory philosophers and I, it's just such a specific group. I think it's it's pretty I like the I like to imagine them, you know. <laughs> like who are these people that are olfactory oh, I mean, philosophers? Well you're one of them obviously so <laughs> Yeah, are, there any, are there any people in that field that you are particularly fond of or whose work you follow closely, you know, um, just for just for people to check out? Yeah, for people to check out, um, Sophie Barvich published oh, yeah. a book recently. Um, forgot the title. Um, I'll find it. And uh, Sophie, how do you spell her last name? Sorry. B-A-R-W-I-C-H. Okay. Let's see. Let's find her. Um, I'll pop her name in the chat for people too. Oh yeah, here we go. Philosophy and history of olfaction and Sophie Barwich, PhD. Voila, Indiana. Yeah. She has a website called Smellosophy. Smellosophy, <laughs> and that's what I think the book is also called. Yeah. Nice. Um, <sighs> and so, like, she went the, the opposite way. I went. She did have a a PhD in philosophy and then she got a position at Columbia University where she was associated both with the philosophy and the science department so it's the same basic idea that I went through that people are trying to bridge those um, you know departmentalization divides that, mm -hmm. that we have in our academia and so she liked the science side of things so much more than now she's drifting towards becoming a scientist or already has drifted there rather than mm -hmm. a philosopher. Um, and yeah, so that, that is a good book. That I mean, it's also like next to my book, I would say the only book about smell philosophy. Yeah, that is, yeah, yeah. That it's, definitely, it's actually one of the only, I, I, we don't have it in our library, which I find <laughs> you, st you stump you you stump the chump because I buy every book for our library every everything you know? <laughs> I don't have that one. Well, so. that definitely should be that. Too. Yeah, yeah, no, it will be rectified. So tell me, um, in all this, you know, over the last couple of years, you've you've obviously um, become very interested in and involved in the old factory art world. Um, so so there's there's yet another drift that's happening in your life now that you're moving also from from science to philosophy and now to art. Yeah. Um, Oh, before we move to that, actually, Ariana has a quick question. Which philosophy school? Um, uh, let me let me rephrase the question. Which philosophy school? I don't understand the question, Ariana. I'm sorry. Which philosophy school you are closer through olfactory is what the question is. Maybe what right. philosophy school is? So that's like a big olfactory? divide into analytic and um, continental philosophy. Um, and so my work as most science inspired work is definitely more for the analytic school of philosophy. Right. Um, there is in the continental school, there's like a lot of interesting phenomenology research going on. So, you know, Melo Ponty has a book and my, my masters, I did my masters at in philosophy at the new school because no other school would take me without any prior philosophy um, preparation. And I wrote that actually on Merleau Ponty and on and Husserl and how they ignored smell too. So smell is ignored across the board. But my all my published work is, is analytic philosophy. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you for uh, understanding the question. Sorry, Ariana, I didn't understand the question, but obviously he did. So, so okay, so we're moving now into, into art. Um, yeah. Uh, so tell me about that, um, that, that interest for you, where that stemmed from. Yeah. I mean, like, obviously from this, like, retelling, it's pretty obvious that I get quickly bored, right? But I also... <laughs> we share that. Like, <laughs> I don't want to yeah. start over from zero every couple of years. And so kind of like the way I found for me is that I'm the smell expert. Right? So everything I do from clinical applications to philosophy has to do with smell. And I can bring in my my growing, you know, like expertise and connections in the smell world, but I do different things within that smell world. And, you know, like if one just hears like, you know, scientist, philosopher, gallerist, seems kind of random, but I, I feel it's like united by the by the topic of all those. Yeah, it's, it's not such a leap from philosophy to art. I mean, you know, I, I think not, that makes a lot of sense actually, so. Not, not such a, a, a big leap. And I have as part of this like society and science grant that I had, um, you know, like one of the nicest thing, like as a scientist that has some visibility, one gets asked by people for help or collaborations all the time. Like as a smell artist, like once a month there will be a artist trying to do something with smell or a writer doing something with smell or a perfumer or what, you know, like there's a lot of people that are interested in your expertise if you're you know, focused on getting your next grant and getting tenure, it's very smart to say no to all those questions because they don't lead to a publication yeah, a big... that you can put on your CV that will help you with your career. It's very easy but... to be distracted yeah, yeah. from it your purpose. Very, yeah, that's, very, I, very I have quickly. a similar problem. Yeah. <laughs> I easily sidetracked with that grant that I had and the freedom I had. I was just like, if it was interesting enough, I was like, sure, yeah, you know, let's do it. Right? I, I have a, I have time. I'm, I'm, I have no boss that tells me what to do, and if that's interesting, and you know, I, I have a small budget to to work with that. So I, I said yes to a lot of those things. Um, Andreas, your, your audio just got a little bit weak. I don't know if it's just me. That's okay. I'm moving closer. That's yeah, it's better. better. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so I, I work with artists quite a bit. I, I curated a show. There's a, um, a meeting of the smell scientists called ACAMS once a year, uh, American smell scientists and taste scientists. Um, and so like I talked them into letting me curate a little show of olfactory art at that meeting. So the, you know, scientists could look into that. I got contacted usually for technical questions by museums quite a bit who are like, you know, we have this exhibit and we would like to add a smell component to this exhibit and how do we go about that? And so I, you know, like wrote a, chapter in a book on museums about how to integrate smell there and, and gave some talks and worked on some projects and so I got um, I got familiarized um, in, in that whole scene of, of smell in, in, in museums and, and in art and my interest in it and also like you know like how I came to smell is different from many other people that it is kind of a intellectual interest more than a like fascinating with the sensory experience yeah, yeah, yeah. and so same, on. Same with me, yeah, I understand so, that, yeah. Um, you know, like the stuff I, I'm interested in, in exhibiting is like stuff that reveals something about perception or reveals something about smell perception specifically or like you know just um you know like maybe also instead of revealing just like educates people about that so it is 
you know, it is an, 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 a, a practical or like a, a, a way of, of, of bringing philosophy and science to an, an experience kind of thing. So that's what interests me the most. I'm not, you know, like I'm, I'm open with the gallery to want to have this more as a, you know, a platform for, for people who are interested in many different aspects of smells. But that's the thing um, that for me connects those prior academic pursuits with this. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense, actually, you know. So tell me a little bit about the gallery. So it opens in January, theoretically. Um, and it's in it's in Chinatown? No, where is it in, in New York? Yeah, it's in it's in Chinatown. It's... Yeah, we're both in Chinatown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We should have like a Chinatown Unite Sent People uh, thing. <laughs> have, have a bus from Chinatown to Chinatown. Yeah, the, well, that's a long bus drive. <laughs> They have one on the East Coast, right? You can go to the Chinatowns across the cities, right? Exactly. That's the yeah. Chinatown bus. That's super that. cool. Um, yeah, so it it is in a it's a it's Chinatown. I'm not, it's like two bridges. I also hear the neighborhood being called sometimes because mm -hmm. it's between the Manhattan and Brooklyn Bridge in Manhattan. Um, and but you know, like the street, all the other stores, all the stores on the street that are not art galleries have Chinese signage there. It's, mainly, it's exactly the same here. It's so weird. Like the gallerists kind of moved six. in and yeah, yeah. but it's yeah. definitely mixed. You know, it's still it's still yeah. a mix of, of family, old families and, and gallery people. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, uh, I mean, it used to be a, a barber shop that didn't make it through COVID. And then they were mm. looking for um, somebody to take over that space. And so I did. So, so what, how long have you had it? A couple months already now? And you've just been working on the space itself, right? Getting the Yeah, yeah. Events. I've just been, I'm, I'm, I'm renovating the space. Yeah. I mean, first I'm learning how to renovate a space and then I'm renovating the space, I guess. Um, and I had it for two and a half months now. And so what's the first show you're opening the, the gallery with? I don't have a first show yet. Um, I'm, I'm in, in many discussions with yeah, many, many people, people. about yeah. shows, um, but there's nothing, no, 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 no contracts have been signed or hands have been shaken or anything along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to open it up with a, with a exhibit that's called that new gallery smell it's awesome. just a bucket full of something that smells like a new gallery smells to like you know like invert because it's interesting uh, if you go to galleries especially when new exhibits open it, it often has like a very strong smell and so yeah, like does. visually Great. visually everything is like you know made like thought through into the last detail but the smell is just like yeah you know it's like that's whatever strong. We, yeah. don't, we don't care whatever that is so i wanted to turn that around and like you know like curate the smell and have nothing to look at and then have the new gallery smell but you know i would need an artist to do that right? um, they uh, they say that about the queen of england you know everywhere she goes she smells fresh paint and so uh, somebody proposed to us like <laughs> to do smells of royalty you know um yeah. And, you know, they were thinking, you know, all this grandiose. Yeah. And I was like, I think the only smell of royalty appropriate today would be fresh paint. You know? fresh paint <laughs> yeah. Anyway. No, that's um, totally like I, I do this thing um, now, not because of COVID, but I used to do this thing at Columbia University where I taught in the architecture department for, for preservation. And it's the same thing, right? Like you like reconstruct a building so that it looks exactly like it looked hundreds of years ago but it smells like a new construction site because yeah. that's what it is right so you're like you're just like building the facade but the experience that when you go there and the you know sense of place and all that is completely lost because you ignore that smell so we mm. you know have those future preservationists the preservation yeah. students have them recreate smells and like try to imagine smells and figure out what different materials smell like and try to pay attention to that too 
You were doing a project with the preservation students, right? Um, was that with the... Uh, yeah, what? like like every... So this is, we do this every other year in the spring semester and we always have a object, a building that around that the whole semester is organized and at the end of the semester, every student does their smell recreation mm -hmm. and sometimes a little installation with that, about that. And so we did two so far. One was with the Morgan Library. I love, was, the, I mean, the Morgan Library is the most beautiful place, I think. It's an amazing it, place. It's and gorgeous. It has, and it has a smell that big, that the red reading room has oh, the yeah. smell that goes with this. That is just a perfect, perfect fit to it. They, constructed, they constructed the smell for the room or it just the room has a smell? It's because the, because the walls are covered in these like, like, odor absorbent um, fabrics that it, oh, right. it preserves the smell. Wow. Um, so it, it, it does smell like it brings you back in time. And it also has like a new part. So it's like been expanded with like a new part built. And so you walk from the new part of the building into the old and it's a very strong olfactory change. Change. Like you huh? step through that door and it, the smell changes from old to new or from new wow. to old. So it's a, a wonderful, um, wonderful uh, object to work on. And then the mm -hmm. other year we did the Intrepid, which is a, uh, you know, a, a aircraft carrier, decommissioned aircraft carrier that's in the, um, in the Hudson River now as a museum, or the, the, you know, the space shuttle is in there, mm -hmm. things like that. So it's like an air, air, whatever, it's a museum. And that's a really interesting uh, uh, space too, because it's like, it has this boat smell that never disappears. And it has like no ventilation if you go down into the parts that is not normally accessible for visitors kind of like preserve the smell from back in the day. Um, the interesting thing about all those recreations is that if you think it really through it all smells like cigarettes. Because no, people, you totally, because you know, <laughs> like that's what the, people do. <laughs> the sailors were just like smoking down there and the whole thing. <laughs> that's, a, that's one thing about when people are, you know, there's so many projects that have to do with locational smells and, you know, I mean, yeah. so many, or, you know, but the one thing that I think people always forget is the human element. They'll be like, oh, Cuba smells like, you know, fig leaves or whatever, banana leaves and mangoes. Yeah. And I'm like, actually, like people smoke, <laughs> there's cars that stink. It's, they all smell yeah. the same. It smells like humans, you know, and humans exactly. have specific it's, smells, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Funny that, huh? Or food, you know? Yeah, the food, yeah. absolutely. Well, so we have about 10 more minutes. These talks always go super quickly uh, and this one's yeah, no exception. I want to, yeah, every time. <laughs> Um, so, so Deborah asks, are there any scent artists that you're particularly interested in, which probably isn't a safe question for Andreas to answer, <laughs> given the fact that he's getting a lot of requests. So I'm going to skip that one. But what are the proposal requirements for artists to present for potential submissions to the gallery? That's a great question. Yes. So um, the, the proposal requirements, I would say what I do want to do, there has to be a smell. And the smell has to be integral, important to the thing. So the test I do in my mind is like, if I were a normal gallerist and the smell wouldn't work one day, would I still open and show it to people? Or would I be like, oh, I'm sorry, something happened, we can't show it today. And so only this is the... actually a really interesting issue, right? It, yeah. We have the same thing with our, our Sadakichi Awards for the for the Art and Olfaction Awards, where we're like, how do you judge an old factory art piece? And one thing we came to is similar to you, which is if if the scent is is integral to the understanding of the piece, you know, versus yeah. an additional thing. But yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it's tricky. I mean, it's a it's a judgment call in the end, right? But like, if you, you know, let's say. Yeah, if you have paintings and then you have a, 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 a odor in the room that you think will put people in the mood for looking at that painting of those paintings, you're probably going to open the gallery if your air freshener doesn't work one day yeah, too. People can totally. still look, 
at the paintings, but they're not put into the, you know, the, the right mindset that you hope to accomplish with that smell. But if you have like a painting of a banana and you have like the room smell, the smell of a raspberry because you want to have this incongruent sensory mm -hmm. exhibits, you're probably not going to open it because yeah. the whole like interesting part of it is missing. Is and obviously, if you just have the yeah. smell standing there, then, you know, there, there wouldn't be anything without the smell. Yeah. So, you know, it's not not the most clear cut test, but that's how I think. But I mean, that's art, you know, I mean, it's sort of, I mean, you know, I, I got my master's in art and the big question at the time was, I was in London, it was the YBA years and everyone's like, well, how do you define art? You know, Martin Creed won the the Turner Prize for this piece where the light turned on and off in the gallery. And yeah. and, and it comes down to intention also. And, and in the context of the, the sort of narrative of, of art, contemporary art history or yeah. contemporary art theory, yeah then it's art, right? So. It, 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 exactly. But you know, like if you're, if you're good at bullshitting, you can probably. Yes, you can be a really good artist. <laughs> into, into believing that the smell is integral and I'm, yeah. I'm interested in exhibiting it, right? If you contextualize it in the right way, absolutely yeah. right. Because, you know, it's a, it's a commercial art gallery, right? So I'm trying to pay the rent by selling art pieces. And those art pieces should integrate um, smells. Right? So it needs to be something that can be sold. A lot of like the interesting older art things are more like a interactive and participatory and experiential kind of thing where it is difficult to see what it is that I would try to sell. Mm -hmm. um, to pay the rent so it needs to be something that can be sold either in in, in a unique object mm. olfactory object or some limited edition kind of thing that relates to that so that's the second requirement and the third requirement is just like currently with covid it needs to be covid safe in some way and flexible in some way. So I wouldn't spend a lot of money for a big production to plan something for February because there is a chance that it will have to be shut down in February. Um, so this is, you know, like the keeping COVID in mind. That's just for now. The other two are just part of the, you know, like the mission statement that I have, which is to have all factory art um, in, in the foreground and kind of like push forward the idea that uh, smells can be looked at as objects, they can be collected, exhibited in museums, be part of collections, sold and bought, and you know, like integrated into what paintings and sculptures are doing. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge. I mean, as, as we've spoken about, it's something that the, the space I'm in right now was originally intended as a gallery space and the rest was sort of the studio space. And it's really tricky, I think, to, to sort of present work in this way and then and then and then um, and then survive, you know. Um, <laughs> but but, but yeah, I think yeah, I think that New York that. is the no <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like I've been, I've been doing this for, you know, I mean, I've, I, it's also, but I'm also in LA. It's a different, it's a different context. I think New York is, you're much more um, capable, I think, of, of doing that because New York has such a, a potent and, and moneyed art scene, you know, whereas yes. in LA it's, it's less, it's yeah. more, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you are an older artist or no one older artist, just email me, right? I'm, I'm happy to Skype and then, about I'll, doing. I'll send the link here for the for the yeah, space okay. too. Uh, bu bu bu. So here's the link to the website, which I think is under construction, but there's a contact form yeah. there. So you guys can exactly. check in with Andreas directly. Um, any other questions about, about contemporary art, olfactory art, philosophy, uh, anything for Andreas before we, before we make our, our day? I'm sorry, I don't mean to be discouraging. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'll, I'll take it as a challenge. Well, as you know, I'm very, I'm very excited about it, and it's. Um, and then you're still good. here. You're still sitting in this. Well, that's the point, right? It's, it's doable. Out. But I'm not, I'm not doing art exhibitions anymore. Nah. <laughs> okay.
um, and, I, and, and luckily there's, there's better places for that. So. Uh, but, but, uh, so any questions for Andreas while we're still, while we're still here? Um, uh, hmm? Anybody? I think Joseph is raising his hand. And oh, good. I'm sorry, Joseph, I didn't see. So Joseph, do you want to unmute yourself and ask? Yeah, hi. Thanks, hi. Uh, Andreas. Thank you um, for the intro and the talk. Um, yeah. I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know uh, what, what would you be looking for specifically in terms of the, say I would contact you or an artist would contact you, would you want it to be in the form of a pitch or just uh, an introduction? Or I just wanna make sure we'd be communicating in a way that makes sense for you in the way that you would want to receive uh, whatever yeah. it is. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, a, 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 a rough pitch would be great. And whatever way you contact me, I'm gonna ask you to talk to me in person and you know try to explore different things. Right? It's like it's always it's a lot of moving parts, right? So I'm trying to be very open and go from everything that's like kind of like perfume, only a little more adventurous than perfume, to very um, you know, conceptually um, driven things and I'm trying to find a balance. So it's always like, do I have enough of this? Do I need more from that? Things may be not good for now, but maybe good for later. So I, I, I think, you know, like a, in, in conversation, um, things can be discovered that are, are mutually interesting. But if you start out with a pitch that's helpful and I know what you're, what your mind is, where your mind is at. Cool, sounds good. Thank you. Thanks. Are you in New York, Joseph? No, I, I actually am uh, in, in Montreal in the freezing oh, cold. Oh, très bien. <laughs> well, si similar to, to New York, but it's it's colder. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Yeah. But it's a cool city, Montreal. Yeah, it's cool. Um, well, thank you for, for the question. Thank you, thank you guys. Yeah. And then uh, Ariana has a question. What else will the gallery do except art objects for selling? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> no. Focus on that's focus it. on being a gallery. That's that's the plan. Like, what else could I be doing? Probably workshops or things like that, I guess. But yeah, I mean, like again, post COVID services. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, so I'm trying. Like for my own interest, I'm trying to become better at order delivery. And so I set up this whole system with like tubings that like sends orders to here and there and can present the orders and just like find better ways of odorizing spaces for experience and deliver expertise them. yeah yeah and the expertise and then you know also and i do have expertise there and i'm, I'm happy to to help with that and i'm also trying or like planning to get expertise about storage for odors and preservation of odors so i do want to be there as a as somebody who helps older artists, even if they don't exhibit in that space with those mm -hmm. kind of issues. Um, but there's nothing, um, like there's no, no structure in place yet for doing that, right? But um, I'm, 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 I hope there will be at some point. And workshops kind of maybe in the, maybe in the post-COVID world, like I have a nice library of, of olfactory books that I like and I like sharing it. Um, I have a nice collection of odors to, to mix from that I like and don't like sharing all that much because unlike books, they don't disappear. Last. They disappear, exactly. Yeah. I mean, books sometimes disappear. Too. They do. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I mean, I, I want it to be kind of like a, a hub and a center for, for older artists, but I don't have any, any structured plans on that. And I don't plan on doing any um, like online workshops or anything like that, um, at least not for now. Mm -hmm. 
Well, cool. Well, lots of lots of possibilities. It sounds like, and I'm sure it will evolve sure. as time goes on. Um, but I'm I'm very excited about this. It's the first place that is uh, in New York that's devoted to olfactory uh, exhibitions and art. So I think it's very exciting. Uh, and it's New about York's time. Yeah. Way overdue. Yeah, totally. Exactly. I mean, what the hell? So, um, so yeah, so well done. And uh, of course, the Institute for Art and Olfaction is 100% in support and behind you and whatever we can do to help. And not that you need yeah. to go over Thank here you. to help. Thank you so you know. much for all your support. Well, um, so folks, uh, with that, I think we're going to let Andreas get on with his busy day. So, um, you know, his contact information I've popped in the chat, but you can find him at olfactory underscore art underscore Keller on Instagram. And, uh, well, yeah, hopefully we'll all be um, reading about his, his exhibitions and attending in person, hopefully soon. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a, a pleasure talking. <laughs>